Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This story that we read today from Genesis 21 and 22 uh, is just plain tough. Let's start right there. Abraham is asked by God in this story to do something that is unimaginable. To sacrifice his beloved son Isaac. And if anyone but God had made this demand of Abraham, we would regard that person as, if not outright evil, at least a little bit nefarious. For instance, who's the villain of this little story? Once upon a time, there was a poor miller who wanted to impress the king of his land. And so one day, being granted an audience with the sovereign, he bragged to him that his daughter was possessed of the ability to spin straw into gold. The king was impressed with this claim and decided to put it to the test. So he arranged for the miller's daughter to be placed in a small room uh, filled with straw with nothing but a spinning wheel, uh, apart from the straw. The miller's daughter was distraught, being, of course, not possessed of the ability to spin straw into gold. Uh, but just as she was about to give in to despair, a magical dwarf appeared and told her that he could, in fact, spin all the straw into gold. The miller's daughter was thankful and offered to give him whatever he wanted uh, in exchange for his doing this for her. Uh, the dwarf said they'd discuss payment at a later date and went on to spin all the straw into gold. The king waking up the next day and seeing a room full of freshly spun gold, uh, was impressed and called up the miller uh, back to the castle and said, uh, Sir, if your daughter can do this again for the next two nights, I will marry her and make her my queen. And the miller was excited and agreed. Uh, and so the miller's daughter was placed in a slightly larger room filled with slightly more straw and again nothing but a spinning wheel apart from it. And again, just as she was about to give in to despair that evening, the magical dwarf appeared and offered to do the next two nights' work for her. But this time, he named his price. When the miller's daughter married the king, this dwarf would be given their firstborn child. Well, the miller's daughter agreed, seeing no other way out of the situation, and the dwarf went on to spin straw into gold for the next two nights. The king made good on his promise and married the miller's daughter, and some years passed. Eventually, they had their first child, and the dwarf returned to claim his payment. Now, the miller's daughter, now the queen, was hesitant to give up her child, and the dwarf, feeling sporting, said she could keep it if she could within three days guess his name. And now I think I wouldn't surprise many of us here by this point to say that on the third night, the miller's daughter correctly guesses that the dwarf's name is Rumpelstiltskin and is allowed to keep her child. But to return to my original question, who's the villain here? It's Rumpelstiltskin, the gold-spinning magical dwarf who demands that in return for all he'd done for the miller's daughter, she give up her child to him. Now, the story of Abraham is not entirely analogous to the story of the miller's daughter and Rumpelstiltskin the magical dwarf, but we can observe certain similarities. For one thing, Rumpelstiltskin is a blessing to the miller's daughter just as God is a blessing to Abraham. Now, Rumpelstiltskin blesses her by spinning straw into gold, by giving her the opportunity to become queen. Now, God's blessings to Abraham are certainly more numerous and profound. God brings Abraham out of his father's land, which is in Ur, uh, in modern-day Iraq, uh, and brought him safely to the land that God showed him. God protected Abraham when he ran into a spot of trouble in Egypt that Abraham had gotten himself into by trying to pass his wife off as his sister. Abraham promised Abraham was promised by God that his wife Sarah would have a son. And even though Abraham displayed an incredible lack of faith, 
by trying to take matters into his own hands and having a child with Sarah's handmaiden, God eventually makes good on the promise and Isaac is born. And then, in a not entirely un stiltskin like turn, God calls to Abraham and asks him to sacrifice his son, to give him up to God. Now the point of this isn't to call God evil. God certainly isn't. Or even to spend much time comparing God to a magical German dwarf. God isn't that either. The point is to emphasize how truly terrible and difficult a situation in which everyone in this story finds themselves. So let's leave Grimm's fairy tales in medieval Germany and go trudging up to Mount Moriah with Abraham, Isaac, and the two servants. I can't imagine what must have been going through each of their heads as the situation unfolded. Imagine Abraham, who despite his failings, his trying to fulfill his covenant with God himself, finally sees his son Isaac born, the son of his wife's old age. And then God demands that Abraham do the unthinkable. God demands that he kill his son. What, what good answer did Abraham have for that situation? So leaving the servants there a far way off from the mountain, Abraham says, we'll go and make the sacrifice and then we'll come back to you without knowing if he said it believing or just hoping it to be true. Then, when Isaac asks where the lamb for the offering is, Abraham says God himself will provide the lamb. Again, not knowing if he said it actually trusting or only wishing for it to be the case. That on top of the mountain, after overpowering the boy and tying him up and laying him on the altar, Abraham raised the knife to finish the deed he had no idea how long he'd held that knife there. Could have been a minute, or ten minutes, or ten seconds, or a tenth of a second. No matter how long it was, it must have seemed to Abraham to be an unsufferable eon. But then an angelic messenger of God cried out to him and directed him to look at the thicket where God had provided a ram caught by its horns. God did indeed provide the lamb for the sacrifice. Imagine Isaac, who must have been filled with joy at the prospect of accompanying his father to make the sacrifice. This must have been a pivotal moment in his young life, a sign that he was growing up into a man that his father Abraham could trust. Imagine his chest, which must have puffed up a little bit with pride when Abraham told the two servants, the boy and I will go make the sacrifice and then we will come back to you. He, Isaac, was important enough to go along with his father while the servants stayed behind. Imagine his curiosity, seeing that they had wood, they had fire, they had a knife for the sacrifice, but no lamb or animal of any kind. Imagine his fear when his father grabbed a hold of him and wrestled him to the ground, tying his hands behind his back and forcing him up on top of the altar. Imagine his disbelief as his father held the knife in the air, prepared to plunge it into his heart while he lay powerless. Imagine his relief at that critical moment when he realized that this would not be his day to die because God provided a lamb. Imagine the two servants wondering exactly what was going on when their employer Abraham left them alone, still a far way off from the mountain, and went along with the boy without taking so much as a turtle dove to provide the burnt offering. Imagine their disbelief 
As one said to the other, he'd heard the old man mumble something in his sleep about sacrificing the boy. Imagine the boredom as they waited and waited and waited and waited to see how many people would return back to them. Imagine their curiosity as both Abraham and Isaac returned, but with a certain level of tension between the two of them, neither wanting to talk about what had happened up there on the mountain. Those two servants would never hear the story of how, in Isaac's stead, God had provided a lamb. Imagine those times in our lives when we, like Abraham, are faced with decisions that have no easy answer, when it seems like all our circumstances are stacked against us, in those times, God provides a lamb. Imagine when we, like Isaac, find ourselves powerless against the forces that stand against us. Imagine when we are betrayed deeply by the people that we respect, look up to, and love the most. In those times, God provides a lamb. Imagine those times when our lives seem to be nothing more than an unnavigable mess of broken relationships, unrealized dreams, and unfulfilled hopes. Those times when it seems that nothing we say or do will provide even the slightest positive difference in our lives and in our world. In those times, God provides a lamb. God provides the lamb. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who redeems us, who takes our place on the altar of the cross, who lifts us up out of the mire of sin, who sets us back on our feet so that we, like Abraham and Isaac and all the generations that came after them, might be a blessing to one another and to all the world. God provides that lamb. Thanks be to God. Amen.